Yeah, so let's uh, let's start. Oh, before I, uh, I forget, um, the uh, third assignment will be online most likely tomorrow around lunchtime. I was planning to do it right after the lecture, but there is a slight delay. Um, yeah, like I said, we're doing this the first time, so we have to uh, double want to double check it and make sure that everything is uh, as good as we can make it. It will never be perfect, but we we're working on it. Um, so there is a slight delay, but we also were generous with extending the deadline for you. So I hope you're also generous with us when we have a little delay here. Good, so let's start with the uh, with the lecture. Last time we talked about the perspective projection, which uh, is an important part of the graphics pipeline because it's the part that brings the 3D models on our 2D screen. And we saw that we can do this all with matrix multiplication. And um, but of course, this is not all that we can do in, that we do in the graphics pipeline. So today we'll talk about some other things. Um, but uh, before I do that, let me just uh, drop a few more works on the perspective projection because I think there was a little uh, confusion at the end. And um, although I think each of the single steps is quite simple, of course, the whole thing with all these indices and different coordinate systems can get quite uh, confusing, which is why I want to repeat it a little bit and uh, drop a few comments. Um, so yeah, so the the whole process was we started by defined by having a camera at a random uh, at a random at uh, we place the camera at a specific position in the world space, and then we create a so-called view frustum, which basically describes what the camera can see and what we want to bring on the on the screen. Then we do a camera transformation. That is, we switch from the world space to the camera space because the coordinate space, because that is then much more easier to calculate, and it's just a simple rotation. We already uh, learned about that before. Then we transform it to the orthographic view volume and the canonical view volume, which are both uh, axis parallel boxes. Um, the canonical view volume also has the characteristic that is as a specific size. It's a two cross two cross two box or cube. And that of course makes then the windowing transformation easier because we just have to do an orthographic projection, which is basically because it's axis parallel just, and we're direct, uh, projecting in the uh, direction of one coordinate uh, axis. Um, we can just throw that coordinate away and then we have our projection done and the, uh, then we just do need to do a scaling to map it on the window, which is the operation called windowing transformation. So um, <clears throat> to uh, summarize or, or to do this, we realize that in the medium step where we have the, the projection, the perspective projection, we, uh, we cannot do this with matrix multiplication. So we extended our framework in the same way as we already, it, sorry. Oh, that's better. In the same way as we already extended it when we realized that we cannot do translation, at that time we switched from linear transformation to a fine transformation, which allowed us to not only modify the coefficients but also add a constant factor to them. And now we realize that we need a division of the factors, which we can also not do with regular matrix multiplication, even not with affine transformations. So we introduce this projective transformation by uh, saying the homogeneous coordinate doesn't necessarily have to be a one. It can also be any random value, it can, uh, which we named W. And that way we can create coordinates that have this uh, kind of characteristics and then the same for Y and for set, of course, you can figure this out yourself. Good. And um, now there was a little uh, confusion because in the old book they used a little uh, different notation. And in the end, uh, in, in the, at the end of the, of the chapters in the questions and the FAQs, they used this old notation again, whereas in the chapter they changed it to this new notation, which is why I will just describe the, the, the similarity of the both or how, how you get from one to one. So we see here normally we have a vector x, y, z and with homogeneous coordinates we have an additional one here and the transition from here to here is now of course that we just throw away this coordinate and then we have our point here. And here if we do the homogenization here we have to divide by w because then we get the value of one here and then we can again throw that away to get our vector. But that of course changes the x, y and z value. So if this here is the same then this notation is actually not correct because this is then a different x. So let's call this uh, x uh, tilde y uh, and z the same. So let's 
make use a different notation here. And of course, if these two vectors here on the right represent the same point, then of course we have x is x tilde divided, oops, ah, it's hard to draw with this pen, uh, y is y divided by w and for set the same with set tilde, of course. Good. Um, now, if you if you look at this here, if you here have instead of this notation, you use here x, y, and z, then of course this here becomes x, y, z, 1, like here at the top, of course, and this here then becomes w, x, w, y, uh, yeah, it's correct, but I, I don't know why I wrote that. Let's make it, don't want to confuse you more than necessary. W, Y, W, Z, W. So this here, these represent the same. And you see that, of course, if you look at this here, that these two vectors are the same. And this is this notation that they use in the end, in the exercise, only they use there, they don't use W, they use the, uh, the letter H for it. But you see, this is basically the same and it comes from what your vector, uh, what your value X represents. But uh, that's why I wanted to make this very clear because this can be very confusing. But if you know what it is and where it comes from, then it's actually pretty simple and pretty straightforward. Yeah, and with that, we can now, of course, uh, do a multiplication with a matrix. And then, of course, we have in the end here values that are not 1 at this homogeneous coordinate, which is before y, before we interpret them as points in our drawing, we have to divide by this value here and then divide in a value that it gives a 1. And now I realized I screwed something up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You see, I also get confused with these indices, so forget about that here. Yeah, but you see here, this is these are exactly this kind of uh, values that we can create. And the trick now is, of course, to choose the matrix appropriately that we get exactly these values that we want, which for the perspective uh, uh, transformation was this uh, x times d divided by uh, n, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this uh, mistake that I made again, again, it was not 100% correct. Um, that is related to this other confusion we had because the old book uses a different perspective matrix than the new book. Um, and that is because for the matrix, if you do this with this homogeneous, with this extended homogeneous coordinates, you can use a scalar multiple of the matrix and you get the same result. And this is what I wrote here. So, this is base, it's the same as, as uh, in this matrix multiplication, but I just added this scalar factor C. So if you do that, you can also do it like here that you have a C at all the coefficients here. And then if you add that, you see here that you get the same result, only each value is multiplied by C, obviously, when you do the matrix multiplication correct. Now, if you do the homogenization, that, and if you don't screw up the slides. I remember I realized later that this was missing and then I added it and added it to the wrong slide. Sorry for that. So this is C times and then of course you need brackets here also. Yeah, but you, you get the idea. The point is if you do it with this factor C, then this factor C also appears of course in the last column and uh, the last coefficient and if you divide through the last coefficient, you always have here C times c times uh, the rest divided by c times the rest and the rest here is exactly the same as you have here so you see here this uh, really doesn't matter if you take a scalar multiple of the matrix which is why this matrix here which we used last time which is in the third edition of the book is the same as this one which is in the second edition of the book and this is also why when you do the homogenization, the end result 
is the same no matter if you use the matrix here from the left or the matrix here from the right because this is just a scalar multiple of that this is just uh, n times this one but this vector here of course is different and that was the mistake that I had on the slides and uh, it turned out that the same very same mistake is in the book so I don't know if I made the same copy paste error as them or if I copied the wrong uh, thing from the book but in any case it was wrong and we, we realized that during the lecture um, is the student here who told me that there is also a mistake in the book no okay if he listens to the recording drop by and give me your name because I contacted the author and he put it in this uh, error list on the website but uh, he put my name there and not uh, your name so uh, if you let me know your name you get the credit for it as well so that was the the th second confusion now the third thing I was trying to explain this a little bit in the end but I, I I'm, had the feeling I was not really very successful how I tried to explain that mm. There is this thing that uh, it's when, when I saw this the first time I kind of it was clear to me that it works for this division but I kind of had the feeling doesn't that screw up or, or how does that fit with all the other stuff that we had before and uh, in the book you find an example where they show it with the translation using this other notation with this H and not the W um, how if you write it down you actually see that it works out now I had uh, I thought a little bit about this how I can explain this to get you a little an idea or an understanding of it and I came up with this image which was also inspired by an image that you have in the third edition of the book not in the second edition of the book they have a 2d image there uh, or a 3d image because they're using an example from a 2d space um, in the first edition there is an example from the 1d space and I wrote a different example which is also in a 1d space so we have here the idea uh, is uh, we have here a one-dimensional space X and we want to translate this segment to this position here and then when we did this we realized that we cannot do translation with matrix multiplication so we came up with this idea of these homogeneous coordinates we said we're just switching we're just adding a second dimension and then we just move everything up in this to the level of one which basically means we're creating vectors where we just add another coefficient in 1d it's just an x1 and uh, so this is uh, of course then the point x which is a one a vector with one coefficient in 2d it's x1 in 3d x y z1 of course and then we say we do a shearing so we move it over here this gives us x plus some value t1 and then we throw away the third coordinate and then we end up here and we did a, uh, a translation in 1d with a matrix multiplication which of course in a one-dimensional case is uh, ridiculous but uh, you you understand the idea and we saw how we can extend it to 2d and uh, I explained I didn't draw it of course how we can do it in 3d good now the idea is when we uh, introduce this this extension of the homogeneous coordinates that we have now let's use the letter uh, that is not a letter at all let's use the letter H H uh, X H so I'm using this different notation now instead of uh, the W and that's why I'm choosing the letter H and that means if you think about it where this point here if we map that to this, uh, the, pre the homogeneous coordinates as we knew it before it ends up here but if we multiply that with a factor of H it can end up anywhere here on this line so all the vectors here on this line here are perfect representation of this one point here which is actually not that accurate that's better of this one point here in our one-dimensional space and the same of course for this point so if we take here an H for example let's take H2 then we have here 1 2 then we end up at this segment here with these two points if we now do our shearing at this level H and not at, at 1 we end up here 
And of course, if we will project that down now, we get a wrong result. But before we project, we of course do the homogenization. And that means we're going back on this line and end up here again, because we're dividing by two in that case. So we end up here in the middle, which as you see, is exactly the position that we had if we had done it here. So the trick is why it really works is we're multiplying with a factor first, then we do the operation and we divide by the factor and then we end up at the same place. So I hope this makes it uh, a little more clearer than the explanation that I had last time at the end. Yeah, and that was also then uh, one of the last slides I had on uh, had uh, put out uh, last time. We're, we're able now, if we have triangle in a few frustum, to project them onto the screen. But we left out or we made two assumptions. One, uh, one assumption was that the triangles are not completely outside and the other assumption was that they are not intersecting with the with the uh, with a few frustum and this process is called culling so we're moving or dis deciding which triangles are outside of the few frustum and this process is called clipping and we treat them differently because of course in this case we can just throw away the triangle and don't have to care about it whereas in this case we have to create a new triangle so we basically have to cut this off here the bottom and then have a new triangle here that we can project. And there are other things, of course, in the pipeline that we haven't talked about, which we will also talk about later. Good, but let's go to uh, clipping first. So, uh, like I said, not all the triangles are in the view frustum, and we, if we have something like this here, we need to do so-called clipping. So, if we have a triangle, for example, that goes into the view frustum, then we have to basically decide, first of all, we have to figure out what kind of triangles these are and then we have to find the intersection points and when we have intersection point we can introduce a new edge here get rid of this part here and then we have a new triangle that we can project so the task is first of all we have to find out what kind of triangles do we have and um, so what we basically have to do or what, what happens of course when a triangle is partly inside of the few frustum and partly outside what happens is that one edge uh, one vertex of the triangle is inside of the few frustum and the other is of course outside so we take all the edges from all the triangles and check if they are on different sides of the few frustum which means if they are on different side of a specific plane that defines the side of the few frustum so we have to look at planes again and uh, for this it's very convenient to take the implicit equation of a plane which is defined as this or we can also write it as the normal vector n of the plane so this n is the plane's normal vector times p is every point on the plane so this is our variable minus a vector q which is any uh, a specific vector on the plane so remember hopefully that this is the support vector and then the normal vector and um, <coughs> since these are both constant values here we can of course calculate the scalar product which gives then a scalar value which I called here d or the book called it d and I used their notation and uh, here we have a scalar product with a variable of course so we cannot calculate that now but this is then the point where we put the p in and then we get a value and if that is zero then the point is on the plane and we already saw in the first tutorial in a 1d case uh, in a sorry in a 2d case but that is easily extendable to a 3d case that if the point is not on the plane of course the function value can either be positive or negative and we saw that if it is positive no, we saw that if the points are on one side of the plane, they're always positive. If they are on the other side of the plane, they're always negative. And we can use that, of course, to distinguish on which side of a plane a point is. Um, what I realized when I went through the slides just before the lecture again is that I made another copy mistake, uh, copy paste mistake error. Um, for, the, for this and the, the, the next lectures, I'm kind of cutting together the, the slides in a different order than I did last year because I, uh, I, I had to change that because of the practicals and um, I, I, was, I have the proof for this 
but it comes later. So for now, just believe me that if it is on the if the point is on the same side as the normal vector points to, then it is on the positive side. So here, every f of p is larger than zero. On this side here, every f of p is lower than zero. And here, of course, on the plane, oh, let's call this f and this l, f of p equals zero. So this is our positive subspace, this is our negative subspace, and a positive subspace is always the one where the normal vector points to. And that of course makes us the makes the calculation for us easier. So we can basically just plug a point in. So for example, A in line, okay, now I have to change that to We plug in A in F, and that is, of course, on the negative side. B is also on the negative side. So they, this vertex here from a triangle does not intersect with this side of the view frustum. But if we look at this side L now, we see that A, A is on the negative side and B is on the positive side. So we know that this intersects. So this is a vertex that intersects. So we have to calculate this intersection point to create a new triangle. And we can do this easily because we have two points. So we can set up a parametric equation, put this into our here, our uh, implicit plane equation. Then T is the only variable that we have. So we solve for T and then we put T into this uh, into this uh, line equation and then we get the point B dash and if we have for example another value C here that makes a triangle we get another point B dash dash here and that of course gives us our new triangle but in this case not a triangle so if we're dealing with triangles so this was the case that I had before in that case, it's of course easy. You just cut off and you have the new points. You have a new triangle. In that case, you don't have a triangle, but you see here you have uh, uh, this shape where you can just make a cut here and then you have new two triangles. And the same or a, a kind of similar happens here. You also have to do a little more. You cannot just cut it off and have a new triangle. What happens here is that you just uh, do it plane by plane. So you take this and then you cut it off and create two triangles. Then you take this plane and then you see here you already have a triangle and here you have to split it again and then you end up having three triangles but they are all inside of the few first one. Good. And of course the same can go here. You cut off this part, create um, these two triangles for example. Then you cut off this part create this here and this here and then you cut off this part where here you have a triangle but here you have to create another one. Uh, oops. Here we go. So yeah, so pretty pretty simple and straightforward. Simple and straightforward how to do it, but the question now is where do, do we want to do it? Because uh, we have this, this pipeline here where we transform the, the values to uh, um, with this homogeneization and uh, the perspective transformation. So the question is at which position do we want to do our clipping? Um, so we have here these points. Can you read that? Oh, yeah. It's actually an image from the old book. It's not in a new book anymore. Um, so you see here, here is the one, here is the W, and here is the divided by W, and then you have the one again here. So this is the homogeneous divide here. And um, of course, one, one of the ideas that you could have is we do it after the homogeneous divide, because then we have here this axis parallel box so if we have this axis parallel box, the frustum planes are parallel to the axis. So the calculation becomes very simple because the plane equations are very simple. But you end up then having a problem, which is um, 
illustrated by this image, which uh, seems a little complicated, but if you look at it, what, what it represents, it's uh, actually quite straightforward to understand. So this is our, our new set value that you maybe remember from last time. We have set is n plus f minus fn divided by set. And, and this is... Um, this, um, sorry, I lost it. Yeah, we, we, we've shown last time that uh, this gives us not exactly the set value, uh, the correct set value that we would have if we want to have it perfect, but it gives us a set value that stays the, uh, the set values on the near plane and on the far plane stay on the near and the far plane, and in between they don't change their order, and this is exactly what we, what we need. So we have proven that, and we've seen then um, that this is proportional to 1 divided by a set, so that is a function like this, but if you're, since we're looking in the direction of the, the negative set axis, it is actually this function we have to look at, and you see that this is exactly this here. This function here, and this is our, uh, just plots this function here from set to Oh God, set dash. Um, I'm just drawing it again so you can, can see it a little better. Um, and, um, but it is plus uh, um, minus fn divided by set plus n plus f, and that is here this uh, n plus f, that is why it's just uh, moved a little higher than, than here, of course, because you have to add n plus f. Now, if you look at this kind of triangle here, with these uh, set values, where A and B are these two set values, then they are mapped to these two set values, so they will be drawn here. But this set value <coughs> of, the, uh, of the point C is on a negative side, so you see here that it switches its sign, so it was actually here, this is your eye, it was behind the camera, and now it is in front of the camera. So you see that it, uh, it screws it up when you do it here. So you cannot do it after the perspective divide. And this is, by the way, also uh, the motivation why we, every time we have to do the clipping, um, because we could also say, yeah, why, why not just calculate the pixels and then not draw them? But if you calculate them, uh, you, you will end up with wrong, uh, with wrong results. So you have to do a clipping, you have to take care of this, and you cannot do the, uh, the clipping after the perspective divide. Of course, the other uh, option would then be the other extreme, to do it at the very beginning, before you go into this perspective projection. And that actually works relatively simple, because we have already our perspective, uh, our perspective matrix, so we can just take these simple planes that we had here and then apply the inverse transformation and then we get the planes from the original view frustum and then we can calculate uh, which those planes. But it turns out that in practice most of the time we do it in homogeneous coordinate because it turns out that this is actually the easiest way to do and uh, because if we do it there, the plane equations are actually very simple because they are given by this equation. I will just explain it, why these are the correct plane equations by uh, one example. So we have here the, uh, the original vector before, then we do the matrix multiplication, then this one here becomes a W, and then we do the homogeneous divide. So we have different values for X, Y, and Z here but we have, again, the one here. So let's call this um, x2 dash, y2 dash, z2 dash 1. That makes the, the writing a little easier. Now you see here, so here you have uh, this, this um, for example, for the first one, we had That was minus x plus l. Actually, I forgot to to explain why that is, but that is very simple to see. That's probably why I didn't explain it. Um, so if you have x, y, and z pointing out of the screen, 
and then you have your canonical view frustum which is a 2 cross 2 cube around it oh, no, no not the, the canonical view the orthographic view volume which is uh, axis parallel box so it's not necessarily uh, 2 uh, no, no, uh, minus 1 and plus 1 so it is L and R so this is left and this is right so you see to get to that plane that is uh, Something is wrong today. <laughs> here we go. So to get from here to here, this is minus x, and this here is plus l. And then you see this is exactly this equation. So if you want to end up with 0, you go minus x here and plus l back, and then you have 0 again. So this is why this is the plane. and. The other plane is just with a factor uh, with this w mul the, the l multiplied with the w, and we see that here if we look again at these uh, coordinates because we see here this um, this um, wait let me look so I don't make any mistake here uh, this x dash dash is x dash divided by w and that means, of course, if we put that uh, in the, the the original equation here was x dash plus l equals zero. So that was the this here, but this is now uh, this is now the x dash dash, and if you put that into that equation you will see that you exactly end up here so this uh, and for the other uh, planes you can show it in the same way so this pretty much shows uh, that uh, these are the correct plane equations and I think you will agree that these are very simple plane equations where you can very easily calculate that and here we don't have the problem that we screw up our set value because here uh, it works out fine good and um, yeah let's make a break now